Ready? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to talk about is about it's another topic of Christian discipleship. It's about how as Christians, how, how do you deal with the moral questions? You know when you come up against a conundrum, like your boss asks you to lie in work to cover something up for it, or you know that girl hits on you at the bar and you've got a girlfriend, or your mate say to you. We've got some drugs, let's do them. How do you deal with those moral questions? And what I want to talk about is how the Christian faith brings us to a better standing. It raises our dignity as men and women. And I'm going to extract from James chapter 4 something that has been described by moral philosophers as virtue ethics. Now, what do I mean by virtue? The church defines a virtue as a willful commitment, a habit to do the good. A habitual good practice is a virtue. And I want to show you in James chapter 4 that the Apostle James, when he was writing his epistle to the church, use the language of virtue ethics because it was the common currency of the time now i'll show you that in verse 2 james chapter 4 verse 2 you lust and do not have so you commit murder you are envious and cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask so He's just used two of what we call the cardinal sins, lust and envy, to describe why the fellowships are fighting amongst one another. They lust and they envy, and this causes them to quarrel and to fight. And by contrast, he goes on to say, he contrasts this kind of um, envy when he says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there is now three of the cardinal sins. Pride, envy, lust. And there is one of the virtues of grace. The virtue, God bless you uncle. He's a pastor, so we give honor to those that are due honor and a leader in the Christian community is due honor. So, he's given three of the cardinal sins and he's given one of the virtues, humility. So James is writing to the church and he's writing in the language of virtue ethics. He's writing in the language of virtue ethics. So, he goes on to say, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. One of the key characteristics of the Christian man is humility. Don't be moved by pride. Don't make decisions because of pride. When you encounter a situation and your pride rises up within you, resist it. When you act, act from a position of humility. Because if you act from a position of humility, you will never fall into the trap of hubris, boasting about things that you can't do. You never fall into the trap of defending a position that's wrong because of your pride. Because if you're humble, if you're humble, then you can correct yourself. It, humility gives you the emotional space to reposition yourself when you need to reposition yourself. Do you think that Muslims have a problem with pride? Definitely the Dawah team do. The Dawah team, yeah. okay. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? You see, when you stand in judgment of another person's faults, another person's weaknesses, what you have done is you've elevated yourself. Christ says, Remove the plank from your own eye before you take the speck of dust out of your brothers. So in other words, correct yourself. And very often the faults that you find in others is actually a fault that you have in you. 
So deal with it in you first. Now, he, cry, he goes on to say, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. If we understand the fragility of life, the temporalness of life, the fact that life is a passing vapor, that it is simply something that will be extinguished and that all the pride of life, all your strength, all your riches, all your beauty, all of those things at the end of the day will count for nothing. Nothing. It means that you can build your life on those things that are truly important, on those things that are truly noble, dignifying to man and his character. And what are those things? The church defines them for us as it calls us to the practice of virtue habits. Virtuous habits build character. Virtuous habits dignify the soul of man. They don't save you. They cannot make you worthy to enter into the presence of God because Christ has done that alone. But as your spirit conforms to the image of God, it will be elevated. It will become like God and thus it will rise in stature. And what are those virtues? They are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. They are prudence, chastity, justice, courage, humility, generosity of heart. These are the kind of virtues, the habits, that you are to build in your life and act upon. And the more you practice them, the more you do them, the better the man you become. Someone who is practicing courage can stand up to a gang of 12 youths because he has courage in his heart. And if he has justice, he will stand up to 12 youths to defend the old lady that the 12 youths are harassing. Someone who practices prudence thinks to themselves that I don't take a knife to a gunfight because that's stupid. Someone who practices prudence acts according to the circumstances. Someone who is chaste is not someone who allows his groin to dictate his mind. Someone who practices humility doesn't argue with his wife or his girlfriend just because he's sick to death of her being right and him being wrong. He's willing to accept when he makes a mistake. And if you're willing to accept when you make a mistake, it means you can do better next time. The problem, the problem with too many people, the English, is that their pra is full of pride. They'll defend stupidity just because they can't accept they were wrong. And we have made many mistakes in England. We've made many mistakes in the working class communities of England, where we care more about beer and a Friday night shag <laughs> than we do about our own families, about our brothers and sisters in the church. And whilst ever we care more about ourselves, the worse our communities will become. Did you know that the underachieving child in England is the white working class child? Why? Because our families pride just having the job rather than education. We don't encourage our children to aspire because our sense of beauty has become base. It's the girl that we see on the page three of the Sun newspaper rather than the, the Christian sister <laughs> who covers herself with dignity both within and without. As Christians, we need to rediscover virtue. 
Just let me clean my screen a second. It's collected a bit of water. And I'll continue. So going back to James chapter 4, because there's more to be said. He describes the community in verse 4. He says, You adulteresses, you do not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. When we climb into bed with the liberal pluralist culture, when we climb into bed with them, adopt their world view about a liberal, secular, pluralist society where every moral system is equally valid and where every religion leads to God, when we adopt that world view in the church, we seal the death of our own community. We seal the death of the church. But it says in scripture, you adulteresses, it describes us as an unfaithful wife when we adopt the visions of the world, their vision of the future, rather than the Christian vision of the future. It says that friendship with the world is hostility towards God. So if you are in the house of God, you are at war with the world, the flesh and the devil. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, which means to be a friend of God, you have to be an enemy of the world. Christians, rise up against the narratives of liberal, pluralist, secularism and stand for a Christian vision of the future. We are called in verse 7 of James chapter 4, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We are promised victory. We are promised victory only if we resist. But the liberal church and liberal wings of the church are not interested in resistance. They're interested in surrender. They're interested in accommodation. They're interested in getting along. No, Christ said those that are not for me are against me and those that do not gather in scatter abroad. Submit to God as your highest authority, not the parliament, not the culture, not the newspapers. Christians do not submit to the world. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Now notice that the apostle is establishing a paradigm of improvement. He's saying that there are things that you don't know. And if you do them, you are covered by grace. But when you know that they are wrong, you must avoid them. And where you do them, they are sins. So rise above, dignify yourself, grow into the image of God. Stand for the faith, stand up for the truth, and learn to become a better man through the practice of virtue, through the habit of doing good things again and again and again. We've all heard that phrase, fake it until you make it. You might not be an honest man right now, but practice honesty until honesty becomes normal to you. You might not be a courageous man right now, but practice courage until it becomes normal to you. You might be unwise and rash, but practice prudence, taking a step back and thinking about your actions before you do them until it becomes normal to you. You might not have generosity in your heart, but practice it until it becomes the new you. Throw off the old self. Feed into the spirit, sow into the spirit, and you will reap the fruits of the spirit. 
But if you sow into the flesh, if you sow into your pride and your arrogance, if you sow into your lust and your envy, you will reap the fruits of that. And we have a culture that has sowed consistently, decade after decade, year after year, into the wrong things. And that is why it's dying. We need to repent, to turn away from this way of being, to describe and to be a new kind of ontology, and to grow into a new kind of humanity. And with that, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.